Hello. Are we uh, are we waiting on Lee? Yeah, I think both Lee and Benji are on yeah. the uh, invite list, but I don't see either of them.
I chatted with Benji yesterday. He didn't indicate he wasn't planning to come. Uh, on the schedule, it says Lee is joining late, looks like. Uh, yes, but Benji is uh, as a co-host, so that's we're waiting for Benji. Let me ping him. I just messaged him on Discord. Yeah, he doesn't too. get back in a minute or two, then. <laughs> yes. Yeah, why don't we just get started? Um, I can read through the yeah. stuff we usually do. Um, yeah, by by being here, you agree to the membership agreement, participation and contribution guidelines and code of conduct. And should we start with the attendees' introductions? We'll that's go in the order that's on the file on GitHub skipping Lee and Benji. So Martin, are you here? I am here. Sorry, I didn't have the agenda in front of me. And I'm Martin, joining from Paris, France, and working on Apollo Kotlin. I don't have the agenda, so I don't know who's next. Stein, maybe? Stein yeah, is maybe. next. Stein. Yeah. Uh, I'm Shane Kruger with zbox.com, and I'm a maintainer at graphql.net. Okay, I'm Michael Stepp. I'm a member of Chili Cream. Uh, I'm Jordan Eldridge. I uh, work at Meta on Relay. Hi, Benoit here from Apollo. Did we have Yakov on the list? Yeah, Yakov is next. Um, yeah, and I'm Rob from First Dibs. Hey, I'm and Anthony. I'm not a new gen yet on Steven at Netflix. Hey, Anthony at Apollo. Sorry, Steven. Uh, yeah, and I'm Al X. I'm here as an independent. And then hey, I'm Calvin. I work at Apollo on the iOS um, client. Um, sorry for joining late, everybody. I'm Lee, and we'll help pick, pick up the meeting. But thank you for getting things going and getting the intros rolling. Um, do we have folks taking notes today? I think this is often a Benji led event. Um, and so if someone would volunteer to be a primary note taker, that would be awesome. Um, let me drop a link. In the chat, that's our notes doc. If folks find themselves there, it can help take notes along the way. That would be very great. 
Thank you very much. Um, okay. Let's do a quick review of our agenda um, beyond our standard operating reviewing action items. We've got GraphQL over HTTP, um, non-list variables for list arguments, and picking up our conversation from last session on strict semantic nullability. Uh, I appreciate that some of these are Benji's topics and he is not here yet. So we might shuffle stuff around a little bit, but that's our agenda for the day. Um, anything that is missing from this that we'd like to talk about? All right, here in silence, I think we've got the agenda that we've got. Um, I don't believe that we have anything to update from the secondaries. Um, I know at least one of them was canceled due to not having agenda. Uh, and the uh, APAC one also, uh, we didn't have any APAC folks showing up. So um, nothing significant to update there. And we'll take a quick look at our open actions. Um, Okay, uh, the only real major thing, everyone who's looking at the agenda, please feel free to open those action items. Benji and I are about to do significant garbage collection. I'm gonna consider this sort of our last call. Um, over the last couple of months, we've cleaned up a bunch of them, but we are essentially gonna go through all of our remaining ones and garbage collect the rest. We only really have a few left, but the goal is really to enter next year with a clean slate. If we hadn't talked about it, since the garbage collection, we got to re-talk about it to get an action item back open. Um, related to this, I think most of our stale action items are for um, are for changes where the champion has gone dormant. So I think we can also think about this as if you want to open that up and comb through some of the action items, if there's things there that are representing um, an RFC that you are interested in, and you're seeing an action item sit there, it's probably the fact that uh, nobody is is taking championship of that. And if anyone is interested in volunteering to be champions for things, um, that is a great thing to do. And we will just probably open a discussion on the working group uh, board and declare that you're interested in picking things up. It's the best way to do that. Um, all right, let's jump into some topics. I know we don't have Benji here, but I know that there's multiple people working on GraphQL over HTTP. Is there anybody else here who's willing to jump in and talk about that? Martin, I saw your hands jump up. All right, I'll hand you the floor to you. You summoned Benji. Uh, we just had to say his name and uh, he's summoned in the chat. It's JIT Benji, just in time. <laughs> I love that. Look at that. <laughs> Hey folks, sorry, daylight savings time, eh? Everyone loves time zones. <laughs> oh boy, that's right. Daylight savings shifts are upon us. Oh man. Yeah. And they all yeah. happen differently in every country. So I'm all set to Almost join the meeting in 45 me minutes. <laughs> um, no sweat. We, we, you, caught us, you caught us just at the transition from standard operating opening of the meeting. We've done intros, um, we've set up our notes doc, we've reviewed action items. Uh, the one thing, Benji, I'll repeat for your benefit is um, after this meeting, we're gonna complete the garbage collection of the action items. And I use that as an opportunity to call for champions for the various RFCs that have gone a bit dormant. Um, if you see one and you're not sure whether it has an active champion or not, assume that it doesn't and best case scenario, we now have multiple champions, which sure is better than no champions. Um, and so consider that a call for action on anything that you're interested in helping support. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay. Um, just as a, on that topic, um, I did actually go through and close a few of those. Um, and then I found myself actually actioning a few of those, which is why I've not closed them all yet. Uh, but yes, continue. Very good. Um, fantastic way to be the expensive version of a garbage collector. Um, on, on theme for the, the JIT Benji. Okay. We're just about to tip into actual agenda topics. Um, GraphQL over HTTP is up and I think Martin and Benji, that is off to you both. 
I don't have much on GraphQL over HTTP. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this. Um, so GraphQL over HTTP, we've been working on for a while. Um, and about a year ago, we were reasonably happy with it. Um, since then, uh, we have a good reference implementation and a decent test suite that we've been running against all of the various implementations, thanks to Dennis. Um, no major issues have come up. Everyone seems to be reasonably happy with it. So we probably should have moved it to stage two a year ago, in all honesty. Uh, but we are basically, we're planning to move that to stage two this coming month. So in our GraphQL over HTTP working group, which I think is on the third or fourth Thursday of this month. Um, and then hopefully to stage three shortly thereafter. When it comes to moving things to stage three, I'm sure that there is some foundation <clears throat> stuff that needs to be done. Lee, you can fill us in on the details of that. Um, but yes, if anyone is interested in this specification, uh, which I assume anyone who has written or is writing a GraphQL HTTP server should be, uh, please do look over the spec, make sure that you're happy with it. Now is the time to raise any final issues. Excellent. Um, I think there's probably some mechanical stuff that we want to get done between stage two and stage three. That's mostly, can we help people find the spec in, in an effective way? Is all of our governance stocks set up in appropriate manners for those, if that's going to become sort of an official released spec. Um, and we can figure out how to get that stuff done. But uh, this is great. I think, does anybody have any concerns with advancing this to stage two? Questions or concerns about that? Uh, more of a comment, but I was discussing earlier with David at Apollo, um, who uh, was talking about uh, security um, for CSRF uh, consideration. GraphQL over HTTP, uh, there's a discussion uh, there already. Benji, do you think this is something that needs to be added before we go to stage two, or can this be added later? I think the, the whole thing is about adding um, a header about preventing uh, CSRF in some uh, specific uh, scenarios like get requests that don't have a pre-flight. Uh, I mean, I'm no expert there, so. Yeah, it's uh, just um, when you have, it's when you have mutations over get, but I think that- Yeah, uh, stuff like this. But I, I think that didn't be um, exclude that anyway. Isn't there we, a recommendation? We explicitly to forbid yeah. uh, mutations exactly. over get, yeah. And, and with that, uh, um, you don't have the issue. There is still like a the time only issue. In, the, the issue like, can only happen in two uh, in one case when uh, it's considered a simple HTTP request. That can be either a, a GET request, and a GET request that queries has a not a not an issue. The second is uh, if we talk about uh, multi-part uh, form data requests, which we don't have in the spec. And isn't there some consideration about timing attacks? Like you could execute uh, a request and based on the timing of the response, infer stuff uh, from the from the server, stuff like this. I'm not sure that we yeah. need to address that kind of thing in the GraphQL over HTTP spec because those are just regular HTTP concerns, whereas the GraphQL over HTTP spec sort of focuses on how to map the GraphQL to the HTTP. Anything that's standard HTTP, like you know, cookie management, uh, rate limiting, caching, that kind of stuff, I think is concerns outside of that specification. Yep. All right, perfect. Anyways, I don't want to take too long on this. It's for just, uh, yeah, just a simple question. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, I think it's, uh, there's, there's always a bit of, art rather than science in writing these things. The science is what is in the conformance part of the spec. And then 
conformance alone is never enough. You always need some like examples or descriptions or rationales that are all non-conforming. And uh, it does seem like a good thing to have before we have this as like an official published uh, spec is some sort of non-conforming section on how to think about security. And um, a lot of that can probably hand off to follow best guidance, HTTP uh, or internet security, uh, but then anything that is GraphQL specific, especially if it's be, this thing is secure because we have omitted it. It's like, it's really, it can be hard to understand those security concerns. Um, and those are a great use of non-compliance uh, or non-conforming, sorry, I mean, um, notes within within the spec. Um, but this is awesome. I think, Benji, I agree with you that at some point over the last year, we probably could have called the stage two and been decently confident that we could do it since our um, compliance uh, rules for stage two are, we all agree that the direction that this is heading is the right one. Um, we've resolved the appropriate concerns that need to be resolved. And most of them have clarity of direction of how they're gonna get resolved. We, everything that currently is in there is precisely described. And I think that's certainly true for the current spec. Um, and there's reference implementations that people can start to use. Um, and that officially makes this a draft. So we'll call it done. HTTP, GraphQL over HTTP is officially a stage two draft. Um, thank you to everybody who's put work into that over the last year in particular, but um, ever since its inception. Um, okay, handful of action items came out of that. One was, I do think it's a good idea to have some kind of um, non- uh, conforming note in related to HTTP security in GraphQL. Um, there's another one, which is any kind of uh, just whether it's a foundation related thing or it's just like a discoverability thing. We're getting to the point where we have multiple specs in the GraphQL project. And what are the mechanical things we want to do to make sure that it's easy to find all of those things? Like, let's make sure that we do those. Um, and I think there may be a foundation specific thing to just make sure that all of our governance stocks are accurate with respect to the GraphQL over HTTP spec, which I think is probably right, but it's probably best for us to do a quick read through and make sure that's the case. Awesome. I think we can move on. Um, next up is supporting non-list variables for list arguments. Uh, is Shane here? I yes. am here. Hey, do you want to take this one, Shane? If you want. <laughs> um, okay, so I've never done this before, but uh, as I was working with some uh, with something or other, I realized that a variable was not necessarily interchangeable with a literal in the sense that um, if you change a, let's say an argument uh, type to a list type, any literals uh, uh, scalars would be able to be automatically co coerced to a list. And it does not occur for variables. Um, if the variable is defined as a scalar and not as a list. So if it's defined as a list, then the coercion will take place as normal, but uh, because of the type rule um, that's in place, the validation checks that are explicitly defined by the GraphQL spec, you can't define a variable type as a scalar when the argument type is a list, if everyone follows. So I opened a feature request and subsequently a uh, draft uh, change to the spec um, to sort of unify that behavior um, so that with the goal is that changing a, uh, a scalar type or an object type to a list type of the same type then is a non-breaking change for any um, use, any queries that are run against that. Um, I examined 
five different ways of the exact semantics, um, experimented and tried them, and it seemed pretty clear that, um, and I'm not sure how far into the details we want to go, but that there was a, a, a very simple way that would most closely align with the existing behavior and also very simply, uh, when you look at the changes to the spec, then would fit in to what was existing. Um, do you want to continue from here, Benji? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to do this. <laughs> sure. Uh, so essentially, I think we're looking for uh, feedback on this. Um, idea. For me personally, I think it makes sense to try and align variables and values, uh, variables and literal values as much as we can. And this is a weird uh, place where that's changed. And I personally have made the mistake of thinking that changing something to a list is safe to do because of coercion and didn't realize that actually the coercion only works with the literals. It doesn't work with the variables. Um, so that was, uh, so I, having hit this myself, admittedly a few years ago, um, I think that there is value in, in doing this. So yeah. What is anyone else's thoughts? I would like to point um, out it's a non-breaking change as written. I'm trying to page back into my brain why we had made this decision because something in the back of my brain is saying to me that this seems familiar and it sure seems like we did this on purpose and i'm trying to remember exactly why that was the case um and i think it has something to do with and so okay i'm going to kind of phrase this as an, an assumption but really what i'm trying to do is ask a question um because you all have stuck your noses in this much more recently so you probably are much more aware about the details of what's going on um, my assumption here for why historically this has not been allowed, or very specifically that the type of a field and the type of a variable are required to be the same. Why is that the case? Um, is because the coercion of the actual value sent at runtime is the coercion is done not at the moment that a value is provided to a field, but at the moment that the values are interpreted as for the variable types. So if a variable says this is a scalar string and the argument assumes that it's a list, um, that will actually crash because the coercion will have occurred or it'll ca cause some issue because the coercion will have occurred. It'll say, hey, you provided a string. It's a string, great. And then it will blindly pass that string through to the argument that expected a list and it's not a list and either your language will have some runtime exception or you'll start iterating over the characters in a string because JavaScript is weird. Um, because we don't do coercion checks at every single field uh, because that would be expensive. So I think that's why that this is mm -hmm. the case that if we assume that at the stage that the variables come in, they get coerced to match the variables type definition. And from that point on, it is safe to provide those coerced values throughout any argument that that variable happens to be passed to. Okay, so I stated that as an assumption, but it really is kind of a question of like, is my assumption correct here? Am I misreading this? Um, and then I guess the question is, how do we make sure that this works given our existing understanding of how incoming variable coercion works. So we're discussing an impl a specific implementation implementation then, correct? Um, it is implementation, yes, but it probably is also the way in which this gets described in the spec algorithms as well. Well, I'm, I'm not familiar with the uh, the code base that, uh, you know, the, the reference code base. So I, I couldn't answer that. I can say, though, that, you know, if the type definition is changed, right, I think it, you understand this, is that then the coercion to the variable type, like, if it's, 
if you were to pass the variable into a parameter of an object, you know, that would be fine. If you were to pass, if you were to pass, pass it into any other location, it would, the coercion rules would automatically apply. I'm not sure why, you know, so, you know, just like a literal will apply. I'm not sure why that rule, <clears throat> but I'm not I, familiar I, with the code base, so. I have a, I have a different uh, question to this. Um, so when we, like the variable, uh, it could still be a list variable, right? Because what happens with the um, literal coercion is we have um, a single value uh, literal there, and uh, the argument value is a list, right? Will, will be coerced to that. Um, so when we, so I didn't read your spec proposal. So uh, when there is a, a variable de de defined as a list, uh, like the variable coercion is also happening um, very early before we start executing. So in there, we could coerce a single value to a list store. Is that how it's how it was written? That's how it would work. And that, and if you define the variable as a list, it will already do that. I believe it will already coerce a, a, into a list when it reads the variable. If we hit. The only limitation is that it's not going to coerce if the variable is defined as a non list. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I dropped a couple of links in the chat that point to the relevant yeah. parts of the spec. So I think Benji pointed out the, the correct one that's happening within execution time. So, uh, okay. I feel pretty confident about the way that I was assuming things were working now, which is there are two separate phases that occur. One that happens at the sort of initialization of an execution. And that's that section 6.1 link that I just dropped in. And I dropped in like a specific highlighted section there um, where as you execute <clears throat> a request, which is the document and the schema and the name and the variable values. Um, so the variable values there being Maybe there's, a, yeah, I think here we call it variable values and coerced variable values. And we're probably inconsistent with our use of those variable names throughout the spec, which maybe we could clarify that. Um, but anyhow, the variable values that are provided to execute requests are the raw inputs provided from whoever's doing the requesting. Step two of that algorithm is where we call this coerced variable values. And that is provided the... Uh, operation that you're executing and the these input values and then you get back the coerced ones so that particular step and you can click into that one um, if you want to see it in more detail is essentially the one where you lift out the variable definitions from the operation and then you map through each for each type of each variable definition use that as the um, the type to do the coercing to so provided the input to the request and the type for each of those variable definitions, you get back a value that should now be safe to use anywhere throughout um, further execution. And it is safe to use expressly because of that validation rule that the variable of uh, the type of a variable must exactly match um, or be mm -hmm. a, uh, uh, not necessarily exactly match. It's a, sub yeah, be a stronger type yeah. um, than the, um, than the the field that it's getting passed to um and then benji you then highlighted a little bit higher up in the in the chat the coercing field arguments step um that is happening in the context of executing a particular field where we've got the specific field the inputs to that algorithm are the specific field that we're executing and then variable values which is the sort of global bag of values that's getting threaded down through everything so there's one set of and that's that is after this coercion has occurred right so that's where the naming here is probably slightly missed that's not the raw inputs provided by the requester it is the after that coercing based on the variable types has already occurred um and that's in that yeah that section f dot 
um, Roman numeral two. Um, that's the, if the argument happens to be that variable, then you just raw lift the value directly out of the bag of variable values and you provide that through as the value. And we know that to be safe because of the fact that we had done that type checking at validation time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just like read through the spec live. Hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> um, does that provide some clarity on why things work the way they do and whether this is a safe change to make? So we would just need to make some modifications to the execution documentation as to make it to execute correctly in light of the this uh, to make this feature work. That's right. So in order to make this work, essentially in loosening the validation, which is the I'm looking at the um, spec pull request that you've written. We're loosening the validation rule mm -hmm. to say that a non-list type can be provided to um, uh, right, right, right. So we so we can allow the non-list type to be used for a field argument that expects a list type, and that means that at execution time, every place that that occurs we will now need to do an additional step where not only do we take the variable value out of the provided um, variables, we will also need to do a type check to see if the types don't match. And if the types don't match, then we will need to do some kind of like value wrapping in order to make sure that the value that we pass through is one that is type aligned. Right. And there's an inherent trade-off here, which is, so mm -hmm. yes, that's provided more flexibility for us, but in exchange for more work that is happening on a per field basis, but, um, which can but have if, performance considerations. Yeah. Why, why don't we do it differently? Like, uh, why don't we say the variable has to be the exact same type, but in the coerce uh, in the coerce variable values, we allow a single provided variable to become a list version and that would be then closely aligning you know like uh, you would send in the json you could provide a single value and that would then uh, uh, then not have these implications and would be just a one-time coercion before it's executed well that you... already works that already works i think as that's you what you described yeah i think that's what happens today yeah like if the, you say the... that the Go ahead, Benji. Sorry, the, the issue is for existing queries. So if you've got an existing query that already uses a variable that is a string, and then you change an input to be a string list, for example, that um, would be a breaking change currently. If the input is already a list of string, then it's fine. It doesn't cause any issues. But we're talking about changing the type of a field in the schema. For um, for literals, that's safe to do, but for variables, it's not. So it's not generally safe currently. Is it worth it? Like, uh, is, 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 is the use case so big that we want to have an impact on every field? Well, it is only an impact on fields with inputs. And the, you know, it's not it can be every field. Um, that's a good question though. I mean, the, the question is, are hitting so many people this problem that it's uh, worth doing the change? Because we know it's a bit more work per field that has a variable. Um, and the question is, is it worth it making the change? Like, uh, I, I personally never hit this issue, but I could be the minority. Uh, Shane, perhaps you could share what the part of your schema was that made you notice this issue. <laughs> was it was it a schema evolution? Thing? Uh, I do not remember. I'm sorry. Um, I can't remember where I run, ran into it, but uh, 
it was just it was something simple it was like i was trying to write a query and i allowed it was a search and it allowed an array of fields or whatever to to search and i just wanted and the query i'd already written i mean it was some past code that had was based on searching just one field for example i think it's pretty close anyways and so i wanted to change the server code to be able to support multiple uh, fields you know as an enum uh, to the to the, as an argument and when i did so then i broke the uh, client side uh, because it didn't uh, wasn't expecting that um, that's sort of what i remember it's a it was an internal use so it wasn't obviously something that you know we, we don't have exposed graphql schemas so it was just a matter of fixing our client as well but i could certainly see the same type of situation if you had a public schema and you wanted to be able to make that sort of same kind of uh change you know and it could be used for sorting for example you have a sort field says you know we want to sort by name or state or or city and you want to change that to allow it to be so you can give it a list and they'll sort you know i, I could see different use cases um, but I think that's sort of how, what it was. Yeah, it was the sorting that got me. Originally, we were just sorting by one thing, and then we wanted to sort by, for example, city and then name. Um, and we wanted to just, you know, evolve that one argument. Um, but yeah, I I think it, it could be that this is too much of a performance overhead if not enough people are hitting it. So I'm interested to hear if anyone else has hit this or has needed this from a schema evolution point of view, because giving people the freedom to make that single to many change could be quite flexible. Jordan. Um, I guess my question would be, what, is that expected to be like according to the specification of what we say is a, considered a breaking change versus a non-breaking change? Is that cons expected to be a safe change to make or a not safe change to make? If it's expected to be a not safe change, I feel like the need for us to handle it is far less than if this was expected to be a non-breaking change according to the spec and it did break. This is in a, it's a good, I think it's the right question, Jordan. Um, this, so technically this is a breaking change as we found out, like, you know, you tried to do it, it broke. And then you have to come back and look at um, ways in which you would resolve it. But it's breaking in a way that is, makes sense when you think about like, oh yeah, of course, a scalar and a list are not the same. And it makes sense that if I change this thing to a list that someone who's sending a scalar is, it's going to break. Um, the I think the interesting thing is so we have this historical um, this historical feature that scalar inputs get coerced to lists, or, or essentially that like uh, we have the type smarts to convert singleton lists um, automatically, and if you know that that behavior exists then all of a sudden you look at this and you'd be like, well, these old clients that are no longer, you know, validating um, things in real time, if they, like, they actually would just kind of continue to work, right? Uh, and that's kind of interesting in the sense that um, this, you could imagine why, assuming that you get the right additional execution pieces in place, um, that you might assume that, because we know that everyone who's historically sent a scalar here is now after this change sending a singleton list um, that it should work. But the tricky part is the def definition of the variables needing to align and this execution rule, and which is very intentionally put there to avoid having to do additional work at the field level, um, where it's, it's true that it only for fields that have variables, but it's interesting in the sense that there's now going to be this like checking of the coerced, essentially like a double coercion, right? Like you coerce it once coming into the variable and then you'll need to coerce it again at any place where the types don't align. Um, and there's 
probably different ways for us to do that, but it's now means that there needs to be a like r- runtime type checking that occurs um, everywhere that a variable is used, which probably isn't free. Um, what the, do we have an idea of what we think the expected impact would really be? I mean, you know, for GraphQL.net, you know, the whole language is type safe and it seemed to be extremely inconsequential to be able to have, you know, those kind of checks. I've already written and merged the, the experimental feature, but is there an idea why, or, you know, is there a way to measure? I mean, I could measure on GraphQL.net, but is there a way we could, you know, what's the feeling as to what is the real impact here? I mean, you know, and how many variables are we talking about? You know, is every request expected to have a variable? Are we talking about one in 10 requests and one variable per request? What's, how, how do we really think this is going to impact? Um, it's a good question. I'm maybe equivalently concerned about additional complexity as I am actual runtime performance that like this essentially adds a new step that you need to do. Um, which means there's potential to misinterpret the step. It's just like a new, every new thing that we add is a new constraint, which makes the solution space for doing interesting ways to implement execution slightly harder. Um, and so I'm more worried about the like future potential impact that we don't see yet because we add another step in the algorithm that you have to account for everywhere. Um, like Benji, I'm sure this fits in in a nice way into your alternative query planner approach, but you might imagine other places where having the explicit assumption that once the variable values have made their way through coercion, you can now like safely es- essentially just replace them in anywhere that a variable exists without having to do any ex- additional work. Um, yeah, ben- Benji wrote roughly the right code that this looks like. Um, so I-, I think like the actual runtime performance overhead here is probably modest like almost every single query has a variable i would say like far more than the majority maybe in the 80 90 percent maybe higher which should be a guess and then of those that have variables not every single argument or every single field is using a variable of course but they're probably getting used i don't know in some order of one or two orders of magnitude below all fields yeah there, there's also a check for a list of lists fields. yeah list of lists not as simple? Uh, the way that I implemented it, it's a recursive routines. And so it didn't really seem to really uh, make it any more complex for that scenario. Yeah, and our uh, existing variable coercion handles that as well. So I'm not too worried about our ability to do that. I'm curious what others think. I'm leaning in the direction of not favoring this change because I wonder if our threshold of the under of the known value of the change is worth the complexity. Because I'm trying to have an expansive view of the complexity add, because there's I think at the top edge of that, it is like literally, should we implement this specific feature? What runtime overhead do we in- endure? And it's like probably modest at at worst. Um, The second degree complexity is this, like we've added a new step into the algorithm. So every alternative execution algorithm now needs to consider what was once an explicit assumption is now broken. Um, And what does that do to all alternative ones that need to come up with their own interpretation of the algorithm? And then there's Mm -hmm. sort of a third one, which is um, the... 
sort of bleeding the what does it mean to be a subtype um, because this literal to singleton list coercion thing does not exist in the type system anywhere in GraphQL currently. It's purely a like how to take dirty incoming data and convert it into um, type aligned data to use throughout the system. And this would be the first time we introduce a new rule to the type system that says that a non-list is in fact a subtype, an explicitly allowed subtype of a list. And I imagine there's more places that we'd need to go evaluate that than just variables like um, objects implementing interfaces, does that need to do the same thing? Like if an interface says this must be a list, but an object type that in implements that interface says that it's actually a singleton, or is it, I guess it would be the other way around. Um, is that allowed? And so I think there's just like a bunch of places where this new type rule would bleed out. So anyway, the, my point is that it's easy to look at this through the lens of like this one very specific change, but there's probably some cascades of complexity that we'd want to think about, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it, but it does mean that like that's on one side of the balancing act and the other side needs to be like a clear articulation of why when we, you know, if you're writing like the press release of this got added to the spec, why you would want to see, or roughly how many people do we think would be like, hooray, like this is fantastic. This unlocks a thing that I wanted to do um, exactly. that I wasn't able to do before. Um. I'd just like to comment if if you put that on one side of an argument, just like to say on the other side of the argument, you've got the fact that the existing, you know, there's a lot of existing complexity in allowing scalars into lists as it currently exists throughout the entire code base. It's not simple. There's a lot of places where that code exists. That's been, you know, um, supported you know, for a while, whatever. But I think it's, to me, it's more important that you have an existing behavior that's uniform in the whole code base, except for this one little area. And that's what's gonna cause people to assume that it works in a way which it, which it doesn't, which is what Benji and I ran into independently. And it's just like, you know, I'd rather it didn't support it anywhere than the fact that <laughs> it supports it in 90% of the use cases other than this one scenario now causing a breaking change. Um, and I think, yeah, personally, I think that's a strong argument. It's like, you know, it's, it's just, you know, you know, would like it, you know, as a GraphQL spec, we should design a, a system that's that's uniform that, that users know how to use without needing to know what the intricacies of the detail is. And that that's how I see it. Yeah, the, 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 the issue that I also see is like, when like, I, I'm looking now on the distributed GraphQL side, when you have now downstream services, to support that have the old behavior and you get the new query, then you have to distinguish between when you build up these query plans, how you uh, distribute subgraph queries. Uh, this is like, it adds complexity because now we have the uh, new, the old behavior that we have encoded in all GraphQL servers today and the new behavior that we have to account for. So it adds complexity over the uh, overall systems. Uh, so while uh, you can make the argument of um, consistency. Uh, this is already implemented like that. So it now adds complexity. Jordan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I guess I the lens I would see it through is, uh, I think it makes sense in a theoretical sense. I think the, the um, like counter argument is a practical one. And I, I think I would be tempted to say practicality wins in, in the in the short term, um, but that we if if there is mounting evidence that this is a practical concern and not just a theoretical concern that people really do hit this, um, that it would be worth reconsidering. So I guess I would be tempted to say like, let's leave this as a proposal and see if we accumulate more instances of people you know interacting with that or indicating to us that this has been a problem in practice, and that would be the sign that like this is something that's worth moving on. But that's that would be the lens that I would see it through. Uh, 
I like that lens because I agree with the consistency case that the fact that this scalar to singleton list coercion occurs at all implies that you might consider that it would occur in the type system as well. And the fact that it, the type system is, this type system does not include that behavior. The type system works in a way more similar to traditional type systems. Um, that certainly that is a place that confusion could occur. So I think that is right. Um, and I like that nudge on on better understanding the practical outcomes of that. Um, okay, I think we've got follow-up actions though, which is great, uh, which is, okay, this is probably on the cusp of being a problem worth considering where one is let's get more clear what is the practical impact of of introducing the change. I think the second is that we've started to come up with a laundry list of other areas that could be affected by this change that's broader than the original proposed change here. So it's certainly not limited to a validation concern. The validation there is, is correct in the sense that it's protecting against an issue with an execution. So at a minimum, the execution needs to be resolved. Um, but variables getting passed into arguments is one place where the type system rules are applied. And there's, if the argument here is consistency across the type system, then we should be looking at anywhere where we're considering a subtype supertype relationship, um, which is gonna happen in interfaces and objects that implement them. Um, I think I see in the chat, Michael saying interesting things about how gateways and subgraphs work about the boundaries between those things needing to be clear. Um, so anyway, I don't know what the answer to all of these is, but I think it's worthwhile to say if we were going to introduce this in a way that expands the whole GraphQL ecosystems type way that we think about type systems, we should do a little bit of an exhaustive search across the spec to understand all the places where that would need to occur. Does that sound like the right next actions? Anything else we want to talk about on this one? This is a in super interesting one to bring up. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. We will move on. Thank you, Shane and Benji. Um, strict semantic nullability. Jordan. Yeah, uh, I guess I want to start with uh, thanks to Lee for taking sort of the the sort of broad ideas that I had, and I think digesting them to something much more concrete. Um, I think, you know, I think my plan is basically to close my discussion topic in favor of the one that Lee opened. I think it it addresses this the same issue in broadly the same way. Um, I wanted to make sure, you know, I think that there was a lot of very productive discussion on, uh, on Lee's post, discussion post. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we're sort of all in agreement about what what needs to be done or like what what actionable things um, are are left, um, sort of like our next steps. Um, and then I also wanted to share a bit about how I'm thinking about what we can do at Meta over the next say six months <laughs> um, to uh, to drive this forward from a sort of um, practical case and share what I'm thinking and maybe solicit some feedback on other things that maybe others see that we could be doing. Um, so maybe for next steps, maybe I'll turn to you, Lee, to see what you see as the next steps based on your um, on your on the your participation in that discussion. Which part of the spec are we talking about? Just the <clears throat> true nullability thing that we basically um, switch off the bubbling or? Sorry, so this is uh, specifically with, related to Lee's follow-up discussion. Um, which he posted in response to my initial true nullability. I think he's called it uh, true semantic nullability or or strict semantic nullability, I should say, um, which I find with that. Um, and I yeah, so I, I think it, we're sort of, in my mind, I think we've transitioned over to that being the sort of more concrete um, like way forward. Um, thank you for the tee up. Uh, I think... 
in my, I, I'm also trying to think about what are the next steps here. Um, I think that the breakthrough from at least my perspective, I'm curious if other folks share this who have read through it is that we realize that Benji's proposal um, with the, the star proposal, which took me a while to wrap my head around exactly what that was trying to do. Um, I understand that proposal much, much better now after spending some time, Jordan, with both you and Benji thinking about this together. And I sort of like started writing this draft of uh, like, I can kind of see in my mind's eye what I think might be right. And I just don't know exactly where it's going to run into problems. And so it was kind of an exercise in brain dumping and fixing errors as I encountered them. Um, and an interesting thing that happened was realizing that I had was coming to the exact same conclusion that Benji had come to, but with like a different <laughs> way to describe the essentially really the the syntax. Um, and I think Benji had a really helpful follow up here to articulate why these were actually the same and um, reframed it in terms of like we can actually now kind of move on to the debate about which of the syntactical approaches is going to be the best one. And uh, honestly, I'm not totally sure how to move that discussion forward because it's. There's real trade-offs on on both of those two. Um, but there's a separate thing, which um, Michael, y you were pointing out, which is like, there actually are, aside from that, two very different approaches to think about of how to address um, the next phase of nullability that we want to do. One of which was this bubbling, like disabling bubbling. And then the other of which was introducing a new kind of thing independent of our existing non-nulls cannot error, like always produces bubbling behavior. Originally, I was fairly convinced by the, like, we just need a way to disable bubbling and that'll actually solve our problem. Um, and as I was writing this out, I'm now of the mindset that that actually is going to be quite dangerous because as some sophisticated clients disable bubbling and others don't, the schema designer now has to consider those two cohorts in very different ways and will end up favoring one versus the other at the expense of the other because the behaviors will be so different and uh and actually makes me think that we are probably as a community overusing the exclamation point non-nullable wrapping type um it was intended to be there as a thing that you sprinkle on in cases where it must be true and especially as we're starting to think about introducing a different way in which to produce nullability um it makes me think that we want to use that one even less and in that, if, if we think that that is probably the direction we want to go, then disabling bubbling actually seems harmful rather than producing value. Because um, what we probably instead want to do is have this, have, essentially have a type that continues to have the error producing behavior that we like, which is localized to the field, but introduces the concept of whether something is semantically allowed to be null or not. Um, okay. And then to back up from that, I think maybe, and Benji, I'm curious what, what your take is, but I think probably a helpful place to take the discussion is actually to this, like the different syntaxes. Um, and I'm not assuming that everybody has read the post, so I'll, I'll just sort of recap that. So the general idea is we're going to introduce a new thing. So the new thing is um, there are some fields that whether or not, or aside from the fact that they can error, they can return either a value or they can return a null. And that null is like, we've. I'm in this post calling it a semantic null, but really what I mean is like null is the correct value for the field that you asked for. Null is an allowed value. And then another kind of type, which is only the type described is an allowed. Null is not allowed. Um, that is the way that we're describing the types. And then at runtime, what can occur is that in fact, either of those two things, regardless of whether they are or are not, allowed to be null semantically can produce null in the payload because an error has occurred. Um, and so in order to distinguish between these two cases in the type system specifically, we need to um, describe them differently. And Benji teed this up. Uh, I'm trying to find Benji's follow-up post there, where I think you literally called it like syntax A and syntax B or something like that to try to help simplify the conversation. Um, Benji's original proposal here is we do not interfere with the existing type system. We exclusively introduce a new type system, which is a bit strange because it is now saying that there's another non-null 
type that is different from our existing non-null type, which is that is a thing where an error can locally occur and null it out. But um, at runtime, null is not, or at, sorry, uh, as like a, a true value from the field, null is not allowed. Um, where Benji's originally proposed syntax there is a star after the type, but we can get into what kind of punctuation sigils we want to use. And my proposed um, syntax is we actually introduce a top line modifier, uh, which is probably a, if you're doing introspection on a query, a new Boolean that we introduce. If you're doing SDL on a, on a query, it probably looks like a directive that you set on the schema itself that says a unmodified type that you see is not null is not allowed. Like you explicitly must say that null is allowed by using the question mark modifier at the end. Um, and I'll recap the pros and cons at a very high level. I think it's we can get into nuances here. But at the high level, the pro of the question mark for nullable is it sure looks familiar to anyone who's used the type system before. Um, and therefore, it's going to be the learning curve is going to be much easier to adopt. And if we anticipate that the more common usage is actually not nullable, um, then that means that the vast majority of types that you would see described in a type system are un continue to be unmodified. Uh, whereas the benefit or the pro of Benji's proposed solution is no schema-wide Boolean or modifier necessary. The existing type system works the way it does, and we're only exclusively introducing a new thing. Um, where on the downside, if that new thing ends up being the most common case, we're going to see whatever this modifier is show up a lot. And then the second one is an understand of, this is essentially a new kind of thing that is going to be unfamiliar for most people who have used type systems before. And we need some way to represent this concept grammatically um, in a way that people can understand it. And I think that's uh, raises a bit of a challenge. So I honestly don't, I have a slight preference towards A because I like the understandability argument, but um, the adoptability one is extremely real as well. So anyway, that's just sort of like a tee up and a reread of this since a lot of this happened between last meeting and this one. Um, and it doesn't necessarily answer the question of what our next steps are, but I thought maybe it'd be interesting to just kind of open the floor a bit and have people ask questions or, or talk through the proposal as we've got it written. I guess I'll just, just say like I think that that definitely matches my expectation. I think we can almost see it as like three uh three different tiers where like I think Benji's solution has the smoothest adoption process uh at the maybe cost of of a suboptimal like a potentially noisy or or confusing looking SDL. Lee's proposal I think has a a good end state but a more a tricky net to navigate migration thing, but I, and then I think also um, the the just like disable null bubbling altogether option is like actually a potentially even better end state if we really say actually there's really just two states and this whole error coercion thing can be discarded is like a like maybe even nicer end state at the expense of being completely unviable in terms of migrating <laughs> because that's not how GraphQL works. Um, so. I, I think that's kind of how how I see it, and I I agree. The challenge is, um, like, how do we make a decision like that where the the pros and cons are against different um, like dimensions, um, and and you can't really have an obvious equivalency between the two in order to establish like a shared understanding of how to weigh those two. So I'm, I guess maybe one question would be, in uh, are there examples in the past of this group making decision, tough decisions like that where you have to weigh trade-offs against different dimensions and what was successful in those conversations? Input union, we also had like this matrix of different uh, outcomes and downsides. <laughs> and that's gonna make it into the spec. Very soon. Yes. <laughs> One of I was going to say, oh man, that's that's our example. <laughs> uh, we've been chewing on that one for a while. Um, it it I finally will say, got though, merged that, uh, into uh, GraphQL.js, so hooray. Yeah, there's progress there. I will say that that was a great exercise in 
well, I know that it was time consuming, but it was a great exercise in really deeply exploring rather than saying like, Hey, my idea is a good idea. And your idea is a bad idea. And the other person saying the same thing and then entrenching, it was the opposite. We just, we, we kind of took like one approach at a time and fully expanded it and explored it. And then did that with enough of these things to, we all kind of collectively were trying to rule out, um, the paths and, and doing sort of like a full tree explore to with the goal of when we finally come to a conclusion we all feel high conviction that it is the right one even though it is a really hard decision to make and i think that's actually that process is happening in an effective way even though it's not always in a fast way for input unions and a really interesting insight is that we tried lots of syntactical approaches to input unions and we ended up on a thing that was the simplest possible approach and an approach that optimized for adoptability and minimum um, churn cost for introducing the feature. So mm -hmm. we can take that for what it means for this particular approach. We're going to probably be looking <laughs> for the thing that is the the simplest possible one, which probably means that it's favoring Benji's direction. And we either have to get comfortable adopting a thing that has the least desirable end state, but is the most desirable in terms of the like minimum viable change. Um, but probably the, like process that we need to run next is one where we're doing a bit of a, like a breadthy search in the space. We really understand the space. Well, can we go look at what other languages have done? If anything at all, can we pull ideas? Can we try to, um, can we try to start pruning the tree after we've started to started to do the breadth? Alex, I see your hands up for a while. Go ahead. Yeah. Can we, uh, release both under experimental flags and see what people do with them and what they like? Because it, like it, it sounds like it's an adoptability problem, but people will decide, you know, what they're comfortable adopting. This is a really interesting idea. Um, I'd be cool with an experiment like that as long as you're really, really careful about. I don't. Know, there's always this like uh, double-edged sword of introducing experimental flags, which is. As soon as they end up in broadly used software, people just turn them on and use them. Even if you've worn the hell out of them, that the experimental flag could go away. Um, and it ends up creating its own kind of flavor of change cost. Yeah. So um, I'm at least feeling more bullish that that could be interesting because we have come to what we think is the idea that these are um, pretty close to isomorphic. So hopefully you know, shifting from one state to another wouldn't be too terribly bad. Because you're all, you're also talking about how like um, the, the, the concern with, I think it was Benji's approach is that the, the middle state, the one that has the new, I think question mark syntax would be used for nearly every field and then it would get noisy and we could, we could sort of test that out if we, if we, you know, do a release. I don't know if that's a deciding factor, though. I'll let someone else talk. Um, is our end goal to change people's behavior in the way they craft schemas, like a best practice kind of angle? Or is it just give them another tool for which they can describe their schema? If we want to change their practices, then a more forceful approach, I think, is probably a better end result. I fear that if we just give them both options, they can adopt the one which is easy and keep building schemas the way they do now. Oh, that's such a good question. And good. given that we are of split mind on the right approach, the even the thought of we'll adopt the one that is easy will probably not be unimodal, right? It'll probably be like yeah. some group of folks, like anyone who has decently large schemas or broader is gonna be like uh this whole migration thing sounds crazy like let's just add in the net new thing and anyone with modestly sized or smaller schemas or ones that are easier to make changes because they don't have a ton of ancient mobile clients touching them might look at the like wow this question mark operator sure sounds familiar and to me as a typescript user or c sharp user or whatever that's what i want it and so like even that alone is like do the easier one it's not obvious. I, I can't really predict <laughs> that would be my best guess of what would happen, but I don't actually know. Um, 
but I love this question. I do think actually that there is a um, a fair amount of like, we want to shift best practices a bit as we do this, or we should have an opinion about what is a, what are going to be the schema design principles that will result in the best outcomes for server developers, client developers, and be sort of the most future proof. And, and, I, know, there's been... I want to throw end users in there as well, because I think a lot end of this has to do with like, what is the, what is the user experience that occurs when, when we do encounter an error or when we yeah. mistakenly assume that a field that is nullable will never be null because we can't see and then when the client's like, Oh, this will never be null, but it actually can be null, but they don't know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when I first proposed this, um, before it was asterisk, it was literally in Terabang. It was <laughs> this is non-nullable, <laughs> but if it, it but it can throw an error, and in which case it will be null. Um, and that may be a, a more acceptable than an asterisk as the syntax for something that you could look up and at least get some understanding of. Um I'm gonna be me, I'm think... gonna be the fuddy duddy and say that all of our Character, all of the characters outside of the contents of a string need to be held in the like 128 <laughs> ASCII, you know, primary unit of the Unicode group. Oh, to be clear, and I was using any... two symbols. <laughs> question uh, okay, okay, okay. and question mark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. we'll, we'll rely yeah, on oh, ligatures fair, fair. to connect those in, uh, in your editor. We'll allow it. Um, but one of the <laughs> things I think is really critical is with, at the moment, when you write just like int, you can evolve that later. You can change that to int bang later. Um, and if we have the unlabeled type be this middle type, you can't then make it nullable. Um, but you might not have realized that you were making it non-nullable because it was kind of a by default action. Um, so I am a, I'm a little concerned the, of the schema evolution point of view. Yeah. Um, and I know we've got some more written out thoughts on that particular topic in the thread. Um, so I don't disagree. I think because I was remembering back to this, you know, the person who cared most about getting nullability right was <laughs> Dan Schaefer. Um, and I, you saw him comment on the doc. It's because after I wrote this up, I was like, I wonder what Dan thinks. And I sent this to him. Because he, every time that I had suggested changing the nullability behavior, he'd be like, no, you can't do it. Everything is going to explode. It's going to be terrible. Um, and I sent it to him and he was like, no, actually, this seems right. This seems right. Because <laughs> the real insight was the the realization that, and to be fair, and to be fair to Dan, um, a lot of that conversation was happening before type systems, at least the ones that we were using at the time, but really in general, um, had really good understandings of nullability. And instead, we're kind of lived in the world where anything can be null if something goes wrong. And like that was the frame that Dan was taking. Not that, hey, at some point in the future, this is null is actually going to be an allowed value here, but more the idea that, hey, you might not think an error could occur here, but at some point in the future, you should expect that an error might be able to occur here. Um, and it was more about error management of why he was emphatic that nullability be the default. Um, and where he felt more comfortable with the idea that, you know, a, a potentially trapdoor decision that if you if you do not annotate something as nullable on when you first build your schema, that you can't go back from that. Um, but I don't know, all that to say, I also agree with you, Benji, that like we should be very cautious about introducing that kind of change. I really like if we were in a world where GraphQL is not the only place where this concept existed, we could just like borrow existing knowledge from the world. Uh, we would just do that. It would be so much easier. Like that's actually like the, the understandability problem is the really key one. So I think what I'm hearing is in terms of next steps are, um, I feel confident that we can discard the, like while, while I think turning off null bubbling is actually interesting in its own right for other reasons as well, as someone who works on a product that has a normalized store. Um, and I would, I think we could continue to discuss that separately. Um, it sounds like the, a good set of next steps would be like, just to start collecting a matrix of like pros and cons 
um, of these different approaches. I think another critical one is going to be to actually see what is the best like syntax we can come up with for Benji's proposal. I think currently we're saying it could be anything which allows us to pretend that it could be good. I, I have a fear that it can't be good, <laughs> um, which uh, which may also just help us like just look at that earnestly and be like, it's just not, we're just not gonna make our schemas look like that. Um, but I can start that, that matrix and um, I don't know, uh, Benji, if you're motivated enough to explore the syntactic space uh, or, or whatever, but, or if you want to leave that to someone else. Double bang. Go all for it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll pay attention. Okay. Um, um, Shane, then Stephen. Hi. Um, I haven't read this entire uh, post here. I read the one that came before it and commented on it, but I haven't read this one. So I'm a little fuzzy as to exactly the two different uh, alternatives we're discussing here. And I'll read through it. And I, I really want to do that because I'm very interested. But I wanted to point out that, I mean, I want to give an example of what my use case is and I think we should look at it also from other people that might have this use case. I've got a, a what I think is a large schema, but it's probably modest compared to others. I've got everything typed with the nullability exactly as it is in the database. There's really no uh, allowance or design for a null error to somehow pop up in the middle of, you know, a response and I understand that that may not that there's reasons good reasons why this isn't useful but on the client side this allows me to have a very simple client the client code can always expect that the entire data result you can do it with a fetch query without any third-party code and it makes our client code really small and really slim um, <laughs> And so I really like the proposal I saw where you can annotate it with question marks on the requesting side um, because it allows the clients then to effectively control where they're allowed to, uh, where they want to be able to see errors separately from the rest of the system. So um, I'd like to read up on this and uh, and uh, examine what their, their options are here. But I wanted to give just give that viewpoint as well as the traditional, everything should be null, you know, let the errors fall where they do, examine the errors response and so on. Yeah, I think the, the goal here is basically to allow us to have our cake and eat it too. And to say like, yes, we think people should have the client developer experience that you are able to have today but they should be able to do so without sacrificing the resiliency, which is what you are sacrificing today by having those exclamation points all over in your schema that the, the blast radius of any one error is greater for you. Um, and that's how you're able to achieve that, um, that better client developer experience. It's a fair point though. And I wanna be really clear. I said up front that like, as I was exploring the top level direction of introducing a new type versus um, disabling bubbling that I'm feeling more bullish about introducing new type. That does not mean we should rule out the idea of just disabling null bubbling. Like we should do the <laughs> exact same pro con slicing of that one alongside this. Cause like, especially we, we talked about the input unions as an, a corollary case here where we eventually have coalesced around the simplest possible thing. Disabling null bubbling is probably the closest thing we have to the simplest possible thing. And it has a whole bunch of other ramifications as well. Um, and so I, I just, I want to make sure that we're not like uh, misinterpreting, uh, rolling that one out early. Um, but sorry, Steven, you've got, you got your hand up for a while. Yeah. So as far as next steps, I, uh, you know, you joke about input unions taking a while, but I, I do think this was like the right, the right approach for, for that kind of thing that has just, uh, you know, definite trade-offs no matter which way we go. I think we are in a similar spot here and it, it'll help one with crystallizing what are the options because as you know like we're now to a point where like it's it's hard to describe like which option we're talking about and so uh so one thing that we did there was we have solutions one two three and just like giving them a an identifier 
I think that will help uh, the discussion. And then also the criteria, like A, B, C, like these are the criteria. I think we are to a point now where we're kind of crystallized enough. And also we probably don't need to have every possible solution um, in here. We could start with the short list. And then if there's other ones that people are like, hey, what about this? Do we need to consider this? Then we can add as well if they're you know really worthy of contention. So then alongside that, I uh, wanted to throw out there a... Uh, a slight variation on uh, basically Lee's proposal with a question mark would be ad adding a question mark without uh, adding a strict uh, directive on the schema, and 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 with a, a a slight twist on the default behavior would be that semantically, uh, by default, a null is an error situation, but not requiring not requiring servers to actually return a null and uh and so that would make it so that um it doesn't change the over the wire behavior like servers won't be returning more errors um because that that can break clients in the field if you start returning more errors um and uh but it would be like for for newer clients uh that are using GraphQL 2024 release, uh, we start to interpret uh, these these default nulls as an error situation. And as clients become more advanced in distinguishing um, like how we handle errors and uh, and more advanced in, in error handling, then then we can take this this new semantic um uh, behavior into account and you know so so and, and one motivation for that would just be so that we don't have the like like use strict you know forevermore on on like every schema but also because of that breaking behavior of like adding this like like at netflix for example i can't imagine being able to safely add like this use strict ever because our clients from 10 years ago are still in the field and they, they would just immediately break Um, it's a good point. Like I, both the last thing you said, which is articulating what the migration path looks like, because if if you can't ever complete the migration, that direction gets ruled out. So we have to make sure that the migration is possible. Um, I I linked you some cross out text that is validating your suggestion that we need to kind of clean this up, identify the different approaches, identify our, our acceptance criteria for the space. Um, there's I got a little two for one in in my description because I think I described something actually pretty similar to what you're describing as an alternative. And then after some back and forth in the thread with Denji, um, crossed it all out and added in a different edit. But I tried to do it in a way still a little bit confusing to read, but tried to do it in a way that like didn't remove what I had originally originally written, just added it on top. Um, and so you're you are correct that there actually are like some nuanced different approaches here that are worth articulating with different identifiers. I know we're at time now, but I just wanted to um, really quickly uh, respond to what Shane was saying about how the client control non nil ability really left, put the control in the client's hands. And that was the normal, the initial intention of that. I actually think that this does that in a more elegant way. Um, with client controlled nullability, you still have to talk to your server team and understand the intention of the field. You can't just start putting the operators on things if it doesn't make sense, if it's not, it, it actually, you have to understand the semantics of why this field could or couldn't be null before you can just make those decisions on the client side anyway. Um, so this allows us to do that in the way that we always wanted it in the first place, which was really, we wish the server was giving us better information about what the nullability should be, but everything's nullable because because that's how the servers have to handle the, the null bubbling and error handling. Um, so this gives us that information on the, in the first place and enforces it. And you still get the ability on the client side to catch on errors on any of these fields that like don't, have, if it's strict nullability and they don't have an, a nullability annotation, you can still determine how you handle that. Uh, if you try on fields and you catch and it's null, what do you do? Do you, you know, Go on, go to some other fallback value. Do you show an error to the user? Clients still get the client control of how they handle it, um, but 
client control nullability was never really going to be something where the client could do whatever the heck it wanted to. You actually have to understand what the server wants anyway, or is able to do. Yeah. Um, and I think the, I'm still interested in the client controlled nullability um, proposal. I think like what we're talking about now doesn't overrule it. It just becomes kind of a parallel thing. And ideally they're designed in a way that they work in concert, but ultimately client controlled nullability is more about managing how errors are managed um, more so than like that certainly has implications on type generation, um, but it is more to do with when an error occurs, how do you move that error around in a way that the client has control over where what we're talking about here introduces new information in the type system. And those are both valuable and they could work in concert with one another. So it's like, we're not prematurely ruling out scope to investigate. So um, I, ideally, sorry. Um, ideally, you know, for me, I'd like to see, I'd like to see the best. So you know, my clients don't want to see any nulls in any, in inside the response if there's an error, but we'd like to use best practices to define the server uh, you know, rather than locking you into, to either no information with all null or, you know, no being able to, not being able to null, uh, handle null. So, yeah, I agree. Um, I know we are just past time. I did have one more item that I wanted to share if people are able to stick around a little bit longer. Uh, specifically, I wanted to share how I'm imagining we will explore this practically at Meta. Um, I think we have an opportunity where we have enough vertical integration that we can start to explore some of this and potentially provide feedback um, and also capitalize on some of the advantages that we see. Um, so I, uh, my, my plan, uh, the thing I'm advocating for internally is that we, uh, we have the advantage of an implementation first server, which means like we can derive these values rather than needing to take a manual effort to go. If we're SDL first, we would have to go do that manually. We can sort of auto, you know, flip a switch and be like, okay, the schema now tells us. Um, so I think we will explore doing that uh, via a directive to indicate this third state. So you can imagine something similar to Benji's asterisk or Terabang, but in directive form, um, which then uh, our clients specifically relay to start with presumably will be able to um, interpret. Um, I think we're also going to start looking at the, what does this mean for validation, specifically around like interfaces? Um, like what are the implications for validation with interfaces? Um, and also what are the implications for the semantics of breaking changes? Um, and, um, and then, um, yeah, and just to clarify, I don't think we will look at all at syntax. Um, I don't think that's important to us uh, since it's all just tools talking to tools. Um, and um, so I don't think we'll necessarily cover much ground there, but that's the thing I'm thinking of is I was curious if anyone thought either of those were, were bad things to explore or if there were other opportunities people saw that could help us um, cover more ground here. I think that sounds great. Yeah. Um, I'm going to wrap our meeting up so that folks have time to go do the next things on their busy schedules. But I love that approach. That sounds great. And especially it'll get us in the weeds of the stuff that matters most. And we'll make sure that we don't stay surface level. Um, look forward to hearing about what you learn, Jordan, when you as you do that. Thanks for thanks. driving it. Yeah. Um, thanks, everybody. This has been an awesome set of discussions. Thanks for bringing good topics. And we'll see you all in the next one.